नमो थस भगवत अर तो समुदसा नमो थस भगवत अर तो समुदसा नमो थस भगवत अर तो समुदसा In the Vasudhi Maga, there is a list of different meditations, and um, it's a pretty extensive list. I think there's forty items. One group are what are called anusatis, that we could call them contemplations. There are meditations that use directed thought and imagination. and for example there's buddha nusati contemplation of the buddha dhamma nusati contemplation of dhamma sangha nusati contemplation of sangha and the one i want to talk about in this session is a deva nusati contemplation of devas the benefit of uh, this meditation is first of all the discipline of controlling your mind directing your thought and your imagination onto a specific topic so it's not like um, meditation on the breath or um kasina meditation it's not holding uh the thought process at bay and um or in the quiescence and f- focusing on a fixed object it's using directed thought and visualization and imagination and in this particular topic uh, contemplation of devas allows you to experience and explore higher states of consciousness to imaginatively envisage you know encompass the existence of beings on a different plane of existence than the human so the the way it's done is to go through the different levels of devas and um the description in the vasudhi maga stops at the first brahma realm but you can actually extend it beyond that if you wish so i will now give a brief description of these different different levels but if you really want to develop this meditation you should learn as much as you can about the buddhist cosmological system and the different levels of devas so you have something to work with devas uh in general are beings that are longer lived and more beautiful more joyous than than humans they're still part of the sense desire realm they have not yet transcended sensuality in fact they experience great uh, happiness in sensuality in their existence beyond the devas are the brahmas who are on an entirely different level or plane they're beyond sensuality they exist in what's called the realm of form the rupa bhumi and they have consciousness equivalent to that of the jhanas so they have very expansive bright consciousness but they're not at all interested in sensuality so to begin with the devas we have first of all on the same level you know, physical level as humans uh, like living on this earth are what are called bhuma devas and then we have six levels of devas that abide in their own particular realms in space above the the human realm so the bhuma devas are many and various they live in mostly in natural environments like forests but they're uh, they're particularly associated with trees and then they're called ruka devas tree devas there are also devas that live in the uh, the waters and in uh, even they was are said to live in cities and towns they uh, are generally invisible to humans unless they choose to manifest themselves or if the human has developed the psychic power of divine eye 
also uh, invisible beings that uh, dwell at this level are like nagas, giant serpent beings, supanas, or the thunderbirds, and uh, many others. But we're focusing on the dewas. So you can, if you're trying to do this as a anusati, as a contemplation, you begin by imagining the dewas living round about where you are in the trees and in the forests, or in rivers, and so on, enjoying their existence, playing. Their, their, the name dewa means it has two possible origins. It could mean either the shining ones or the playful ones. Another class of these are um, the uh, Walahaka Dewas. They're Dewas that live in the clouds and control the weather. So in the Buddhist uh, understanding, the, the world is actually full of all these kind of unseen beings. Then we go through the six levels of, of uh, Dewas beyond the earth. We take them from the lowest to the highest and contemplate their existence. You can imagine yourself being there. Imagine the dewas in their in all their finery. The first level are called the Chatu Maharajika. This is the level of the four great kings, and their place is described as being halfway up Mount Sinaru. So they're the first dewas that live in their own realm and they their rulers the four great kings are the protectors of the world the guardians of the world and they are constantly guarding the world against demonic forces like the asuras who live at the bottom of the mountain or angry gods that try to swarm up the side of the mountain and have to be beaten back again and again so they live in, in their own cities around the halfway up the mountain and are followers of the, their, their leaders, the four great kings. And the four great kings are vassals or subjects of the king of the Tawatinsa realm. This is the second level. These are the dewas that live at the summit of Mount Sinaru. They... Um, live in their uh, shining city at the, at the very peak of this. So they're very summit or peak of the physical world or the Tawatinksa they was. The name Tawatinksa means 33 because they're ruled by a council of 33 gods and their head is Saka. There are many, many descriptions of um, Saka and of the Tawatinksa realm, much more than any other Dewa realm. This is the the realm that when um, we talk about Dewas, generally we're thinking about that realm. They have, uh, for example, in their city, they have a a place called the Nandana Grove. It's a um, like a park that's supposed to be the most beautiful possible place to be. So that you find in the in the Pali text, if some place on earth is very beautiful, someone will say it's just like the Nandana Grove. They live a, a very long time by human standards, and they mostly live in existence full of pleasure. The king of the gods is Saka, and the. We have a lot of stories about Saka. He comes across as being a very complex character. He has a, some attribute like a trickster figure. He sometimes plays tricks on humans. But he's a generally benevolent, and he became a follower of the Buddha and attained stream entry in the Buddha's time. The next level up is called the Yama Dewas. The Yama Dewas are the first level where the existence is completely free of conflict because the wars with the Asuras never reached here because it's not connected to the earth. It's in, in space above the earth. So the Yama Dewas are called the, the contented ones or the, the joyous ones. 
and uh, this is the the heaven that um is associated with the the virtuous ancestors beings that are reborn into the yama world you know have escaped from all the troubles of the lower levels of existence they live just entirely in, in happiness their um ruler is uh, suyama uh we actually don't have a lot of information about the yama realm so it remains somewhat mysterious the next one is the tusita heaven and each of these heavens is considered to be twice as high as the previous one in space and the dewas live uh, longer each higher level the dewas live longer they have more more happiness and more radiance uh, the Tusita level is special because it's in this heaven that the Bodhisatta, the Buddha to be, always exists, waiting to take birth on earth. So Gotama Buddha spent many aeons of time in Tusita heaven before coming to earth and being born. And currently Metya Buddha is up there waiting for his turn. So this realm is particularly associated with the Dhamma. And it's said that many people who have attained to a stream winner or Sakadagami will be reborn here. Then uh, we have the, uh, again, twice as high as the previous one, we have uh, the fifth heaven, which is called uh, uh, Nimanarati, the Dewas who delight in creation. At this level, the beings have such a refined level of consciousness that they control their external reality with their mind. So whatever they wish or imagine becomes physically manifest. So they live in this really magical existence where they create whatever they want and they take happiness and joy in playing with the creation. The final sensual heaven, the peak of the, this level is called uh, Paranimata Vasavati. That means the devas who delight in the creation of others. These beings don't create anything of their own, but they live in wondrous palaces and gardens created for them by the Nimanarati devas. So they, uh, they live a life of... Um, pure enjoyment where they don't even have to make the effort of wishing or creating. They just experience this, this uh, beautiful, wonderful existence without any effort on their own. So this is the, um, the six levels of um, sensual dewas. There's six heavens or sagas. Then we make a, um, a major shift the next highest place is the first level Brahmas. And they are well far beyond the uh, level of Dewas in that they're, they're completely non-sensuous. So it said, for example, there's no male and female there. They were all just reckoned as beings. They uh, don't eat in the ordinary way they feed on jhanic bliss you know the internally generated bliss they feed on it so that they're extremely subtle and refined their ruler is mahabrahma who was uh, worshipped by the pre-buddhists as the creator god but in the buddhist system there are still beings higher than him and he's not the creator. So they are very, uh, very, very long lived. They live as long as a, as a world age or at this level. The higher Brahmas live many world ages. So there are four levels of Brahmas altogether. The second level of Brahmas are the Abhasara Brahmas, the luminous ones. This is the equivalent of second jhana. So their predominant conscious experience is uh, piti or rapture. 
as the same as in the, the system of the jhanas, they don't have the, the characteristics or the qualities of vitaka vichara that is thought formation. They don't have thought in the sense of directed or um, verbal thinking. So this, this is uh, interesting that we don't have any stories of, or, or of these beings or, or um, names of individuals. Where we do have in the Brahma, the first Brahma level, because they still have thought formation, so they're able to, in some sense to be active in the world. And we do have names of individuals like Baka and Sunana Kamara and so forth. There's several that are named and they, they sometimes interact with beings like Brahma Sahampati encouraging the Buddha to teach when he was reluctant to do so. But the higher Brahmas are just basically blissed out all the time. You know, they don't really do anything in the world. So the third level Brahmas are the um, Subakina Brahmas. They're um, equivalent of third jhana, and their predominant characteristic is bliss. So one reference as to the difference between the Abhisara and Subakina Brahmas is that the radiance of the Abhisara Brahmas flickers like a torch, but the radiance of the Subakina Brahmas is steady like the full moon. Then the fourth level are the Wehapala Brahmas, or the Brahmas of great fruit, who dwell in perfect equanimity. So that's going through the, uh, the sensual devas and the Brahmas, and if you're developing this as Anusati, you would go through each level and contemplate it in turn. And you can even extend it beyond that to contemplating the formless level. This is beyond even the Brahmas. And I will do, a, I want to do another talk on meditation on the formless abidings as a special meditation. But I'll just say here briefly, there are four levels of the formless beings, the boundless space, boundless consciousness, nothingness, and either perception or non-perception. So this is uh, not taking it all the way to, to the limits of samsaric existence, gradually experiencing higher and more refined, more subtle levels of consciousness. Each level transcends the previous level, and the previous levels drop away. They seem coarse and gross compared to the higher levels. So you're gradually refining your conscious experience by going through this exercise and um, expanding your uh, the possibilities within your mind. There's a... Um, I would say an emphasis or a, um, a teaching in Tibetan Buddhism called taking the big view, that they encourage practitioners to, to do this kind of exercise, to contemplate the different levels of existence, to overcome the tendency to be caught in the narrow limits of your human experience. We tend in the day-to-day -to, -day to be caught up with our petty concerns and our worries and our disputes and relationships and aches and pains and, you know, you know what not, whatever, you know, it, it all seems so important. But if you take, a, take the big view, you contemplate the whole array of the cosmos, you know, our petty human concerns seem very insignificant. When we open up the mind, you know, it's like breaking out of a box and experiencing a, a bigger view, a broader view, and a more refined level of consciousness. So it's a very interesting exercise. You know, it's, it's, it's quite enjoyable to do, and it can um, brighten the mind, uplift the mind, and uh, dispel a lot of... Um, petty concerns. It also, I would say, on another level, it has the 
effect of aligning your being and your consciousness with more divine or subtle forces in the universe, rather than sinking into animalistic or demonic energies, you know, you're, you're raising your mind in, and aligning more with the divine or higher level forces. So I'll uh, offer that for for your consideration, and um, I would encourage everyone to give it a try. <laughs>